Navy 304, this is Tosca Radar. What level will you find? As the summer ends, the 44th Test Pilots course is also ending. For eight months, the students have flown different types of aircraft on arduous exercises. Some beyond normal RAF limits. Some to the very boundaries of the aircraft's performance. But it's not all flying. There are 250 hours of lectures. ...of an aircraft, then from the equation, if we make a certain assumption... ...and even a night school. On the glide path, touch position height, on side time, on the glide path, passing position height, half mile from touch and down, fit a roll, 170, 10 knots, when coming to set two, dot nine out. The night exercise is one of the last of 130 hours each student flies at the Boscombe Down School. Trips are responding. Passes 20. Passes responding. Passes good. Rotate. A significant stage of the students' progress is when they bring together all their newfound skills to test fly a light aircraft. This is a preparation for the preview, the student pilot's finals. To test fly a frontline jet they have never flown before. The aircraft to be previewed are revealed, an F-4 Phantom at Coningsby, swing-wing tornadoes at Honington, buccaneers flying from Lossiemouth, and to America to test fly the F-18 Hornet and the S-3 Viking. The helicopter students will fly the controversial Black Hawk and the big twin-rotor Chinook. First, the staff meet to match pilots and aircraft. We're obviously not going to put them in aircraft they've flown before, and we'll try and stick towards roll compatibility, which I sure. think might we... be a bit tricky this year, I think, in the, some of the, in this tornado F4 Buccaneer. Right. So let's look at tornado then. Well, I'm tempted to suggest that we put Tom Colser on that. My rationale for that <clears> really <throat> is that the tornado being a swing-wing airplane and him being an F-14 pilot, we might be able to get some good read across on the tornado. We've got uh, Steve Moore. Yeah. Yes, they've made a good, good team. team there. Dave Southwood, he's... He's pretty strong, isn't he? He's very he? strong. He's, he's strong, doing yeah. well on the course, and uh, it'd be nice to... I think we get a... As, as the F-18, it's the first time we've done the F-18, I think it might be a nice yes. thing to put him on. Perhaps Harry okay, Fail might be a good man to go in there. Well, let's just put that along the side Sorry. at the moment. Yes, they've made a good, good team. team there. As long as we can keep them out of the pub, I think that'd be... Yeah. Well, to keep his tutor out of the pub as well over in the state. <laughs> Who's doing that one? <laughs> no names, yeah. <laughs> on the only reasonably heavy airplane that we've got this year, the S3 Viking. So they sort themselves out quite easily. Robin Tidyman and Nick yeah, Coulson. Yeah, that'll work out well. Well, the next one uh, to look at is Jim Ludford. Well, I think I'd like to see him in the Buccaneer. I think he would do a good job because he's in the front there on his own. Yes, yeah, so we've got to fly there. He's a reliable guy. I think we'd fly the Buccaneer's captain. Yeah. Uh, quite happy to see him in there. Yeah. So we've got okay. Sergio Bear. Now his background is also mm. uh, air defence. Yeah, He's done some air defence. Yeah. The uh, Mirage on the F1. Well, he'd make a good match up uh, on the F4 then, because he's not, not likely to have flown it. Not likely to fly it again back in France. Well, he certainly won't have flown it. Yeah. Um, so he can actually, if, if we put Les in there, Les being a, a Harrier background man, Serge will provide the air defence uh, side of that the preview. So that would be a nice balance, I think. Who have we got left then? We've got Mirko. Yeah. Now Mirko, he's a big chap. We've got to watch what uh, mm. we put him in. I'd be tempted to put him in the Buccaneer to give him a change. He's had a hard year this year because his size, he, two aircraft he hasn't been able to fly, and he would definitely fit in the Buccaneer. We try to give them aircraft that they have not flown before. And uh, we try to give them an aircraft which they will have some knowledge of, either in its role or its uh, configuration, something that they have something to hang on to. But uh, they will certainly not have flown the aircraft before. A very large portion of uh, our assessment of the students at the end of the course is based upon this exercise, both on the way they conduct themselves uh, during the preview and also in how they, what their report is like and what their final presentation, the verbal presentation is like. The American Tom Coulter and the New Zealander Steve Moore on the right are at Honington, the tornado base. Neither man has even examined the formidable swing-wing aircraft before, and yet they have only 10 hours of flying time for the entire project. They begin work at once. Yeah, 
Taken three, taxi runway 09 and QFE 1025. Each preview syndicate has a supervising tutor. The CEO of the Boscombe Down School, Wing Commander John Bolton, is at Honington. Well, my role is initially to supervise them from the test flying point of view, make sure that they are not uh, going outside the brief, and also to get some experience on the aircraft myself uh, so that I can assess the report. From Honington to Odium, where Fleet Air Arms student Al Howden is leading a syndicate to preview the Chinook helicopter. And we'll transition away and transition out to the area and look at the single engine flying. Happy with that? Definitely. The other members of the syndicate are the Canadian, Mike Micklejohn, and JT from Singapore. Okay. Yeah. Like the fixed wing students, none of these young helicopter pilots has flown the test aircraft before. The Boscombe Down Trio will test the helicopter both at high altitude down to the lowest height permitted. JT records on video the instrument readings for later analysis. Now Mike Micklejohn is coming down to minimum height. In battle, supply helicopters like the Chinook have to operate as low as possible. The Syndicate are briefed to assume it's an untried aircraft and are testing its controllability at very low level. 50 feet. This is called nap of the earth flying. Well. There we are. That's fine. I don't know. We, we would cruise at 50 feet, 135. Yeah. You see the gap? Half past 12. I'm slightly in front of the nose. Put it in the nice state thing here. Got the wires. Yeah. Little wires, you got them? Yes. Good. Okay, you're getting close to being stuck now. If you can just keep it around about 100 feet, that would do nicely. Okay. Follow through the gap now. I was just going to give him some yeah. leg by taking the FCS off on him, actually. How do you feel now? I'm doing a sloping ground landing. The Chinook is positioned for a landing on sloping ground. A difficult manoeuvre for a big helicopter, but one which might well have to be made under active service conditions. The Syndicate have to assess all aspects of the Chinook's fly. Moreover, as all the tests have to be completed in 10 hours, there is no time to waste. Let's go home. The last airworthy Lancaster in its hangar at Coningsby. Les Evans, waiting to fly the Phantom for his preview, takes a look at this warplane of the past. One of the bomber's four Merlin engines is being serviced, as during the war, by a young woman. For a fighter pilot like Les, there is only one aircraft to be approached with reverence, a Spitfire, one of the Battle of Britain Memorial Flight. I'd give a right arm to fly this, it would do a tremendous handling. Very different handling to a modern fast jet. Uh, directional control will be somewhat reduced from uh, a fast jet. Uh, the prop wash effects will be quite high. You'd expect some adverse yaw from the aerodromes. Um, I wouldn't mind betting the control force is slightly high, but I don't know. It's back to the F4 again. <laughs> At the moment, the Phantom is being flown by the other half of the Coningsby Syndicate, the French student, Sir Gilbert. He is trying to come to grips with an airborne VC-10 tanker to refuel. Refueling forms a vital part of present-day defence strategy and the capability of the Phantom has to be assessed as part of the preview. Voila! As Serge refuels, Les is briefing his airborne minder, Jack Dowling, an experienced Phantom pilot. Um, looking at the stick forces for G, as I said, uh, yeah. and, the, and the lift boundaries. His tutor, and Tim Allen, is supervising the preview. Up to 1.3. Okay. Can I um, make an interjection here? Jack, it's your aeroplane. You're the expert on it. Yeah. But uh, knowing wind-up turns, I can see that at the higher speeds and the higher G levels, the aircraft is going to end up extremely nose-low. So yes. So it becomes got... a major safety consideration. Yeah. 
So it's up to you, I think, to tell Les when to but, call, yeah, call certainly it quits. If we're, yeah. if we're supersonic, getting more than 40 degrees nose down, you're at 5,000 feet, you need 8,000 feet to recover. Yes. So uh, okay. we'll have to see how it's going and how, how deep the nose is going on. Yeah. Serge lands. He and Les are working as a team, but they fly the aircraft individually. This exercise in the Phantom is actually extremely good value from my point of view. You regard the whole concept of flying an airplane much differently. Uh, it's not, uh, not actually using it for its job, but you just fly an airplane and naturally seem to assess it as, as you're flying it. I'm certainly finding that um, uh, flying, for example, the Phantom as I am doing, with very little knowledge of it, it's surprisingly easy to fly the airplane and you naturally, after the course, the course does the right thing, you start to actually assess the airplane as you're flying it, without even thinking about it. So your approach to flying has changed? Oh, yes, yes. As most of the flying from Coningsby is over the North Sea, the air crews wear special survival clothing. It appears cumbersome. How quickly can it be got on? If you have to, you can do it in about a minute. You can get the whole lot on. Because when you're holding alert, you know, you jump out of bed at 5 o'clock in the morning, you've got to get it all on in this part of the country. So we'll uh, go and pick up all the details, certainly the latest met yeah. uh, when we outbreathe. Yeah. Dave, yeah. is our aircraft ready yet? Yeah. 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 We're Foxtrot 4 Victor. Yeah. Uh, call sign up there is 32. Now, Les, uh, what's the gauge for? Well, this is a force gauge which we use for seeing what the stick forces are. Uh, as you see, if I squeeze it and get a reading on, on this gauge and the little black needle stays at the maximum that, uh, that we've actually applied. And you can just reset that in the air. And primarily we use it for holding against the control column and then we can measure the stick pull force that we're applying when we hold against the side of the column. It aids us in actually deciding or determining how stable the airplane is. Uh, part of the stability of the airplane is shown by the forces that you need to apply to the stick. So we take uh, various heights and speeds just note the forces required to change attitude and to change roll. Les eases his Phantom out of its hardened hangar and taxis to line up on the Coningsby runway. In this part of the preview, Les is sampling the Phantom's handling at low speed. Next, it's stability. The Phantom is, of course, an American aircraft, and it is in America that some of the school's previews are to be flown. The Naval Air Test Center at Patuxent River, Maryland the American equivalent of Boscombe Down, though with some national differences. The centre includes a test pilot school modelled on the original at Boscombe Down, but five times larger. There are three Boscombe Down syndicates previewing at Patuxent River. Harry Fail, who flew Phantoms in Germany, is to present his preview partnered by Dave Southwood, the Buccaneer pilot. They're preparing to test fly the exciting Hornet fighter. The uh, F-18 Hornets, the latest US Navy airplane in service, used as a uh, strike attack airplane and also for air defense. It's quite hard coming out here because the amount of information we had on the airplane before we left the UK was, uh, was fairly limited, so that's we really got a lot of the, uh, the information, the manuals, when we arrived here on the Monday to then start flying on the, uh, the Wednesday. 
So uh, we had to do a lot of work when we first arrived just to get familiar with the basic system so we could fly the aeroplane. We had to take uh, an exam on the basic systems of the aeroplane so that we could fly it from the front seat. These schools in many ways have a lot of features in common, but the courses here are much larger and they're more predominantly US Navy pilots and engineers and backseat crew on the school as well, whereas BOSS can be trained virtually all pilots. It's been a very interesting aeroplane to fly because this particular airframe is a fairly early development aeroplane. It uh, was from about halfway through the development program. So from the handling qualities side, there have been a lot of things we've found on it which have subsequently been corrected on the aeroplanes that are uh, in service with the fleet. So as well as before on the course, we've always flown aeroplanes really in the production service standard. This is an aeroplane to a, a pre-production standard. So there's a lot of interesting features about it that we have found. quality side, the turn performance, manoeuvring of its excellence, and the systems on it are very modern, state-of-the-art systems, which again, we haven't actually had a chance to look at on any aeroplane on the school and on the course so far. Links between the Empire Test Pilot School and that of the American Navy are close, though there is friendly rivalry. Rear Admiral Ned Hogan. I'm a graduate of the Empire Test Pilot School, and, uh, and I came back from England to Patuxent River and again, I, I, I tend to have biases. I always thought the Empire Test Pilot School was the best school then because I'm the graduate. Now that I'm in charge of the Navy School, I think it's the best. And so the, the quality of the individuals are almost the same. The young men and women that get involved in it are more or less cut out of the same cut of cloth. They're high achievers, they're aggressive kind of people, they're uh, highly active, uh, they have a professional approach to doing business. So. Basically, the, those personality traits and, and characteristics are, are awfully similar. And the products of both schools, I think, are uh, close to equal. Will Nick Coulson and Robin Tideman be equal to testing the Viking? It's a two and a half hour trip this afternoon, and so far we've spent, both Robin and myself, we've spent about uh, Sunday yesterday, we spent from nine o'clock in the morning till five o'clock in the afternoon plus what, three, two, two hours this morning so far. So there's a fair amount of preparation that goes into uh, each flight. And that, that's just basic preparation for the flight. We've obviously planned the sortie profiles and things before that as well. So there's a lot of preparation that goes into it, yeah. His partner, Robin Tideman. Well, on this sortie today, we're going to uh, have, first of all, a qualitative look at the aeroplane, just to see if it has any uh, bad vices. And the major part of it today will be just gathering data uh, in terms of its longitudinal stability and uh, then some asymmetric work and finally the last half an hour we'll spend in the circuit pattern just looking at the various modes of landing the airplane. The Viking is a carrier-borne anti-submarine aircraft which has no equivalent in the British forces. To fit into aircraft carrier hangars the Viking's tail and wings have to fold. The Viking must be one of the largest aircraft to have folding wings. Interestingly, the electronics carried are reported to cost more than the aircraft itself. ETPS students fly at the Tuxent River on a no-cost exchange basis. In return, some American Navy students do their previews at Boscombe Down. The Viking takes off for the first of its testing flights. If it is a little-known aircraft in Europe, the same cannot be said of the helicopter about to be flown by Bob Horton. This is a UH-60 Blackhawk, which was built for the US Army. Um, it's about 1970s design, uh, but it's, of course it's their most modern battlefield helicopter, really. It features a lot of quite unique design features. Uh, for instance, it's absolutely covered in armour plating. You've got all this sort of stuff to protect the pilots. Um, it's also uh, been designed to be air transportable in the back of a Hercules transport craft, which is why it's got this very squat appearance to it. 
Um, it's also got a couple of General Electric T700 engines up there, which give it an enormous amount of power. The tail rotor itself is actually canted at uh, about 20 degrees from the vertical, and that's because the whole aircraft, uh, when once they'd built it, it had a very far off C of G, centre of gravity, and had a lot of problems trying to hover it and, and what have you in forward flight. And so some bright sparks said, well, why not just tilt the tail rotor so that it's actually producing an upward thrust moment as well as a lateral moment. And so it now provides about 2.5% of the total lift force in the hover. The previews are in reality part of the final examinations of the test pilot's course. One of several unique features of the Black Hawk is the stabilator an all-moving tail surface which, it is claimed, greatly aids stability. A claim Bob will be testing. As Bob begins his first test flight, Dave Southwood brings the Hornet into land. The other half of his syndicate, Harry Fail, is checking the details of his first sortie with his American observer. The testing is divided between the members of the syndicate each investigating different aspects of the aircraft's performance. All right. OK, if you turn over to page number two, I mainly talk on my tape. It's going to be in, in German language also. <laughs> Have you got, uh, you're going to use the HUD camera? Yes, I plan on. Do you know how to use that? No, not quite. The flight observer, himself a test pilot, has two roles. First, to help in gathering data for Harry, right, and secondly, to make sure the aircraft is brought back in one piece. Harry's first Hornet flight begins. The aircraft carries a price tag of $17 million per copy, so it is a heavy responsibility for all concerned. Most of the data they gather is about the Hornet's performance, and that is highly classified. But it is known to have the very latest computerized aids to flying. At the end of his first two-hour flight, Harry Fail was certainly very much impressed. Ah, fantastic. Really. It's amazing, you know. F-18 is really new generation. To what I was used before and what I flew before, and it's like Star Wars almost. <laughs> well, I guess it's going to be a sleepless night. I have to write about it, what I found out. For all the students, there is little time for sleep. For when they return to Boscombe Down, they will have to make that full presentation of their findings, the final test. The audio notes made in the air have to be transcribed and carefully analyzed. As Dave Southwood and the other students work on their reports in America, in Scotland another syndicate is being briefed for their preview of the Buccaneer. So you're going straight into an aircraft which has no instructor in the back seat, there's a navigator in the back, uh, you'll be putting him into situations which he's probably never been in before. So moral is obviously be careful, plan everything ahead, know what you're going to do, and brief the guy in the back before you do it. And basically what I'm aiming to do is a very gradually... Now, there are no dual-controlled buccaneers, which might account for Jim Ludford's observer's somewhat thoughtful expression. When it's stabilised at that G, yeah. at that speed. For Mekro Zuliani, this is his first buccaneer solo. How did he feel about it? A little bit nervous. But uh, I think that uh, the preparation that uh, we had uh, during the course uh, is uh, the right preparation for the right approach uh, to a new aircraft uh, to fly. And uh, as I said, uh, Jim, the experience to jump from one aircraft to another aircraft. Mirko was chosen for the Buccaneer partly because it was one of the few aircraft into which the Italian giant could fit. Most of the RAF's buccaneers are ex-Royal Navy. Having been designed for deck landings, they are immensely strong.
turn left now. That's nice. I'm well out there. Just aim to the right of uh, Lossy Town. OK. This is about the best of your idea, then. You're feeling immediately uh, power and high brakes. Uh, you should have about half air brake now and oh, 87%. Okay. There's a coming out for an increase of the power. 90% power. Sub and the 90% of the deal. Good. And the old 180. Okay, yeah. I could be traffic. Stud, I'm sorry, stud two I want. Stud two you would want. Thank you very much. Because of their training, the ETPS students seem to a man to have acquired considerable confidence and experience in a remarkably short time. We're looking for about plus 15 knots at this stage, okay. so we're talking about 156 knots. Jim Ludford. One thing the course has done is uh, tune us into getting from one aeroplane and becoming fairly familiar, or adequately familiar, with another aeroplane to go off and do the sort of tests we've got to do with it. And of course we creep up on the, on the limits. It's rather we go straight to them, so just take a very gentle approach to it all. Perhaps we're flying it more as an aeroplane than the guys on the, the squadron do. They do with it what they need to do, but we've got to go out and find the corners of uh, the little box within which you can operate it. Uh, it's fairly obvious to uh, a lot of people that there are deficiencies with all aeroplanes. You can, uh, just by talking in bars and crew rooms over the years, you get to feel that. The handling of the aeroplane is probably going to be uh, quite adequate for the job. But there could be some aspects, of course, that we haven't heard about or which we need to look at a bit more closely. As Jim taxis out, Merkel returns for a, a touch and go. Fast. Okay. Just keep it going down. Okay. I'll tell you when to put the power on. The touch is fine, but it's no go. Bring the nose wheel off. No, and we'll fly away. A power is a good. A little bit of power. Power, power, power. power. For Mirko unintentionally shuts down an engine. Do okay. not, do not put up the undercarriage. Okay, I go on the right. Sir. Yes. Apart from that little local difficulty, the rest of the flight went very well. And as Mirko graphically explains to his observer, he is delighted to have discovered a flaw in the Buccaneer controls on the very first flight. Yes. Yeah, no. 16,000 feet go down. The preview flying over, the really serious work for all the syndicates, the report writing. It is of the greatest importance, for if done badly, it could lead to total failure. The finished reports are impressive documents. Preview has been over for now 10 days, and we've just received these submissions. Uh, on This is the S3 Viking, and this is the F-18 Hornet, the two previews that were carried out in the USA. You can see it's a, a fairly weighty tome, and for 10 days writing, there is an awful lot in there. And in fact, I think at this stage, the chaps are moving so quickly that even the tutors would find it very difficult to produce something with equal quality and volume in the time. The long hours of writing over, next the final hurdle, the verbal presentation. All that now remains between them and the coveted title, Test Pilot. <laughs>